Very good to see you again. Um, I hope that the past two weeks have been great. I'm sure they have been. Um, thank you for praying for me, those of you who did. Um, I had a wonderful time in Malaysia, a very, very wonderful time. It's been about two and a half years since uh, I was there. And uh, one of the things that happened that was very special for me was that before I left for Malaysia, there had been a uh, WhatsApp thread going around several people uh, who I had pastored before in, um, um, in Malaysia, in my in different churches that I was pastoring. And a group of them wanted to come and uh, have lunch and to arrange lunch. And I had not seen them for about 20 to 25 years. Yeah, 20 to 25 years. And all of them, this group of people, were now leaders in um, different orga Christian organizations. And some of them had started their own churches and some their various organizations. And uh, they wanted to tell me what was going on, what had been happening uh, these past 21 years or so. Yeah? And so this group of people arranged for lunch, and I was uh, very moved and very touched to hear what God had been doing. And they wanted to remind me of the things that we had done together when uh, they were in my church. And they would remind me of things that they had been taught and that had become seeds that had been planted in their lives, and that had grown. And so it was very interesting to see what had happened over the 20, past 21 to 25, 20, 21 to 25 years. It was, it was pretty amazing. Um, and they began to show me uh, videos and, and pictures of what God was doing through them in the different places. So there were about... Uh, about eight of them that I had, that somehow spontaneously had got, got in contact with me. And uh, God was doing great things. I, I was just amazed. And they were telling me that the things that God was doing to them, they had been seeing in their church 21 to 25 years ago when we were together. It was amazing to see that um, what God had planted in them was now blooming to such an extent that uh, it was beyond my, my wildest dreams, so, so to speak. I don't kind of dream about think how things are going to go in the future generally, but they were sharing with me different, different things. So one of them was uh, uh, Robert, who, sh who shared with me, with, um, and he reminded me of things that we used to do when I was in my early 30s, maybe 30. 30, 29, 30, 31. And I had forgotten all these things that God had done. And um, he shared with me how... Uh, now, I shared with you some, some, of, some of the things that um, he had shared. And I, do you remember, some of you, I've shared about how he was a new convert and he had uh, become the general manager of um, um, the... Uh, 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 a series of hotels and, in, and nightclubs that were there. And he was the GM of the, the biggest nightclub in town. And I had shared with you, I think, about how when he became a Christian, the first thing he asked me is, can you pray for my nightclub? You know, can you, can you come to my nightclub and pray for it? Because I believe that God can move in this nightclub and we want, I believe that a fellowship can be started. He was only a few months old as a Christian. And I, at that time, I was maybe 29 years old or, or, or 30 at the most. And I was not experienced enough to be able to give him a wise answer. So I just said yes. So we went, and he and, and, uh, and, and one or two others, we went to, the play, to that place, and we started praying. And as we prayed, we encountered a lot of spiritual demonic powers that we, you know, we really hammered at. and. Uh, and I remember those days, I was completely youthful in my zeal, and we just went forth, and our arms were swinging and all that as we were praying for it, and we felt a breakthrough. A few months later, a fellowship was started, and out of that fellowship, he was telling me 
um, many of them had become Christians and many of them had become full-time ministers. One of them was Jay, who was the, the DJ at that, at that place, and he, was, he had now pastored, pastored a series of Tamil churches and also was an evangelist. And God was using him in Indonesia, in the uh, Philippines, in different places, and, uh, and even in England and all that. And he was being used by God. Another one was another... Uh, and actually, Jay uh, had come to the Lord because of his wife who uh, um, had a problem with her, with her ovaries. She had no fallopian t- tubes. And God did my, a mighty work upon, upon her life. And he shared with me that, about his two daughters who are now pastors of two different t- Tamil churches. It was, it was amazing. Another one he, he shared about was uh, the, the, uh, the bartender who was very, very depressed. He, was, he, was so, he felt so uh, dejected because of the fact that his pay was so low and he had no future and all that. Today he's a pastor. Yeah, it was just amazing. And, and, just, and then he said, Pastor Michael, do you remember after that? We got so excited, we decided we're going to have a big evangelistic meeting in, a, in, in, in this hotel. And you remember what happened? We brought all our friends and people started manifesting demonic spirits, right? And he said, and you were just doing it and then you were very calm and uh, you, you brought me along and, and you said, come, let's, let's do this. This is, this is going to be fun. And he said, you said it was going to be fun. Now, I would never say that. I'm 65 years old and I don't think casting out demons is fun. But I could see why I would, in my foolish days, say that. Right? And he said, we just very calmly cast out the spirits. There were so many of them. And that man now, is, a, is, is like a very strong Christian and a leader in his church and all that. And he said, you know what? I took that with me. Now, what, uh, he's, he's, one, of the, he's uh, the, one of the leaders of one of the full gospel businessmen's chapters. What I, I did was that I went to the streets and there's a place in KL, it's called uh, Brickfields. It's a, it's a very poor area. And it says, what we did was that I took my members and we started feeding the poor and then doing everything that we can on the streets. We just did it on the streets. We didn't have any place. And then the YMCA saw the work that we were doing there and they gave us a place. And now we have five to 700 people coming for our, for our healing services. Five to 700 people healing. And then he showed me videos. And he says, you see? And he showed me this person who had, had a stroke, who was not able to walk. And uh, he showed the videos of him and his colleagues uh, other, other people who are in my church, praying for them, and he was walking. Another woman who was, who, who was uh, um, you know, uh, on a prone position, and she got up and walked, and just all kinds of things. He showed me pictures of, of, uh, of people manifesting, and I don't, don't know whether that was the, the best thing, but, uh, um, and, and demons cast out and all that. And then the next person wanted to share about how God was, God was working in the different places. And he says, you remember... Um, Casey, I said, yeah, yeah. I remember, Casey is now a pastor. He was a pastor in Kajang, which is in Malaysia. And then he emigrated to, 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 to Australia, and he started a church as well. And do you remember John? I said, John, yeah, I remember that, yeah. And he says, now he's pastoring. He's, a, he's in charge of three churches right now, you know? And so, he, and for some reason, uh, um, these, these guys wanted, wanted to tell me, we want to encourage you because we haven't seen you for so many, for so many years. And I, I want you to know that all of us, all of us, after 21 years, we are strong in the Lord. We are stronger than before. And I said, we are more zealous than we were before. Imagine that. And so I wanted to, I wanted to just, you know, come off that. I, next week I will share a little bit more because there's, what I've shared with you is just a tip of, tip of the, the iceberg. What I want to share with you is maybe a question that we can ask. Let's say we fast forward to two years from now, yeah? two, two years from now, and we look back at today and ask the question two years from now. On this day, is it the 8th, 8th of, of August? What, now that we are two years hence, what do you, would you say 
what's going on in our lives on the 8th of August, 2022. Were we on the way up or were we on the way down in the trajectory of our life? Was 28th of August a watershed in which God was doing greater and greater things or was it a watershed in which we were declining in our spiritual health and in our life? What was it? And sometimes you can't tell. You can't tell from this moment itself today just based on externals, don't you think? So I'd like to share with you a, a verse, a few verses from Isaiah chapter 28 and, um, and put before you something that I feel will prepare us for um, fall conference. Something that is important for us to be able to be praying about now that we have time because there are things that God wants to do in the long term that can only happen in the long term. They cannot happen in the short term. And I would say that it's not too late to think about things long term right now. Okay? Woe, verse 1, to the proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim and to the fading flower of its glorious beauty. So the first proposition is to be a fading flower. The, fl the flower looks very glorious, very beautiful right now, but it's actually fading. And you can sometimes not tell whether the flower is fading or is it or is the trajectory or the pathway or the, the direction of, of its life is towards um, fading away or, or getting more glorious. To the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is at the head of the fertile valley of those who are over, overcome with wine. He's referring to the valley of Jezreel in the north, north part of uh, Israel. He's referring these, this prophecy is to Israel, not the northern part, the northern kingdom. Behold, the Lord has a strong and mighty agent as a storm of hail, a tempest of destruction, like a storm of mighty overflowing waters. He has cast it down to the earth with his hand. The proud crown of the drunkards of Ephraim is trodden underfoot, and the fading flower of its glorious beauty, which is at the head of the fertile valley, will be like the first ripe fig prior to summer, which one sees, and as soon as it is in his hand, he swallows it. And so he's referring to this group, this population of Israel that are living for short-term gains, right? Short-term gains for the things that are impressive. They are impressive. They are, um, they are um, intoxicating. Yeah? And at the same time, they are also immediate, right? The three eyes, the immediate, they're intoxicating, and they're impressive. Some Christians live for those things, right? They live for things that are impressive. They, they, are, they value things as, as they are influenced by culture, right? They go for impressive things. They also go for things that are immediate because they are they're wanting immediate whatever gratification or satisfaction. And the thing the third thing is that they are intoxicating because they are drunk. They are and the, the Bible often speaks about things in the Old Testament of, of wine as other joys. The wine of the Holy Spirit, the new wine of the Holy Spirit is the joy of the Holy Spirit. And other other wines, other other wines are other joys, right? So they are intoxicated. Because of that, as a result of that, their whole soul is filled with things that are making their discernment very, very fuzzy. Yeah? Okay, in that day, the Lord of hosts, and now he's referring to another population, another group. In that day, just as judgment is coming and the, 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 the fading begins to show itself, in that day, the Lord of hosts will become a beautiful ground crown, sorry, a beautiful crown, and a glorious diadem to the remnant of his people, a spirit of justice for him who sits in judgment, a strength to those who repel the onslaught at the gate. So there's two, two, two types of people, one who are a fading flower, the trajectory of their life is downward, right? And there's another tr uh, population of people whose trajectory is gaining strength. It's gaining strength. And you can't actually tell by one slice of time looking at them. Some look terrible, but they're actually on the way up. Some look 
really impressive, but on the way down. And it could be the other way around as well, you know? You can't actually necessarily tell. But probably the people themselves may be able to know their soul better, yeah? A strength to those who repel the onslaught to the gate. What he's saying is that there's these people who will not only be able to be glorious, but they have strength enough to, to overcome the Syrians. That's very powerful, very, very strong. The question is, am I gaining strength or am I losing strength? Is the trajectory of my life in this watershed of, of the moment one in which I'm moving towards God, towards greater strength, or away from it? Yeah, away. Or am I, or am I fading? And so there are these two trajectories. As the remnant and that of the fading flower. It's all the direction that we are going in. And I pray that as we prepare for fall conference, that God will set us on a trajectory, not from the fall conference, but from now. Because now is a time in which I believe all of us have the power to make long-term decisions. Long-term decisions. They may be short decisions that you make, but they have long-term consequences. And I want to put it to you, actually, that long-term decisions are decisions that have lasting effect over our lives. I don't mean short-term decisions that we make all the time. I'm going to lose weight. I'm going to eat better. I'm going to eat healthier and all that. And then after that, we do it for about a month or two or three. And then after that, we go back. I don't mean these short-term decisions. I don't even mean short-term decisions to do your quiet time. If you're making these short-term decisions to do your quiet time again and again and again, then you haven't made a long-term decision about quiet time. You made a short-term decision about quiet time. Is that right? Hello? Yeah? Because you're always making a decision to have your quiet time. If you're making those kinds of decisions, then these decisions are not long-term decisions. They are not actually going to be decisions that have significant effects upon your life for 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 30, 40 years. I am now, today, at a result, as a result of decisions that I made 47 years ago. And these 47 years ago, I made some decisions that I didn't realize are going to be decisions I make for a long term. All I knew is this, the decisive things that were taking place in my life. And 40 years, 7 years later, I am seeing the consequences and the results of these I want to put it to you that actually, like it or not, we do make decisions that have long-term effect. Some decisions are decisions to only make short-term decisions because of the fact that we're not necessarily committed to those decisions. For example, during Lent in 2020, we asked the question uh, in our church, what happens if what we're doing for Lent really should be something that we should be doing for the rest of our lives. What happens if, not just for Lent, but for the rest of our life, we live holy, separated unto God, careful about what we receive, what we receive into our eyes? What if we develop a life of prayer long-term, so much so that we, our strength will increase and the more weary the days get, the more strength we get. What happens if we make, make a commitment to that? What if we make a commitment based upon promises in the Bible? And there are some very basic promises in the Bible that are bedrock promises upon which other smaller promises are built. Like, I will give you my spirit and you will receive power from on high and you will be my witnesses in Judea, Samaria, the uttermost parts of the earth that the things that I do, you will do also. These are important decisions. These are important promises that re will only come to pass if you decide to make a decision for the long term. Does that make sense? If you are deciding to make a decision because you want to see God use you mightily, like some of these guys did, and they didn't realize they were making these long-term long -term decisions, but they, they were. If you decide that, then you can take hold of the big promises of God. Does that make sense? The big ones, the decisive ones, the prevailing ones, the ones that make our life different, that change the structure, because these will require a different frame for your life. These big ones, the big ones that are transformative, 
cannot be done within the framework of your own, your own scheduling, your own commitments, your own particular, the shape of your life. They have to be outside of the frame kind of decisions. Amen? And so, what happens if, so that's what we were, we were, we were, we were thinking uh, two and a half years ago, what if Lent was a way in which God is saying, I want not just, I want you to do this temporarily, and after Lent, you can go back to your lattes and your, all your, your cappuccinos and all that. Not that those are wrong. I just don't understand how we do Lent. I'm not going to have a cappuccino. whoop de doo what's, what's that going to do for you? Have the cappuccino, by the way, for goodness sake. But focus on important things, right? not like cappuccinos and lattes and all that. But maybe God is in that, telling you to do that. Okay, so you may be right. <laughs> the thing about it is this. What happens in Lent if God, the Holy Spirit, is speaking to us and doubling down upon us and saying, I want your life to be changed. I don't want you to just have a small kind of a, a spike in your, in, your, in your spiritual life. I want you to be changed. I want you to gobble up the serious promises of God, that you will be empowered by the Holy Spirit, that people will be kind of impacted by your life. Now, a long-term view is really good because what it does, it helps us to look with perspective, not on little, little spikes and little um, um, hillocks and, 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 and hills and valleys in our, in our graph, but over the long time, over a long time, how's it been the past 20, 20 years? How has it been in our witness for 20 years? How has it been in our relationship with God, our fellowship with God? Has it been satisfying? Does that make sense? So I, I, I feel that Isaiah 28 draws a, frost, a, a sharp contrast between those who are wanting things instant, immediate, uh, impressive, and intoxicating. These are the ones who actually don't have much of a life. They're, they're coming back, they're, 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 they're up and they're down, they're up and down, and circumstances are bad, they, they really, really go into prayer, and when, they, when they're not, then they're, 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 they're relaxed. They're not decided, they're not, they're not serious about it. They're not ready for any, anything serious spiritually. But there are some who are. There are some who two years ago in Lent decided something and they decided that they would give themselves over to certain disciplines, including prayer, and it has changed them. It has not worn them out. It has actually made them stronger. I'm interested in that kind of thing that makes you go from glory to glory. I don't mean these little spikes of things. They're all good. They're all good. And, and God does bring us into short-term decisions as well. Don't get me wrong. But we're well, we not talking about that right now. We're talking about long-term things that make a big difference. Have you been a long time in one place and not been able to, 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 to see the fruit of it? And I feel that for that to happen, I think God has grace for us. Amen? All right. So, sometimes what happens is we, we come to places in our lives that we realize that the frame of space that we give to God or to a particular discipline is presumptuously small compared with what we are expecting. Sometimes, I'll give you an example, okay? When, when I was, um, just before we, be, we began the church, I had ministered at different conferences in different places. And people were interested in seeing my church in Malaysia. And one of them who came, came from one of the universities up north, and he played the saxophone for his, the worship team in his college. Right? And he was like a star there. And so... He said, can I bring my saxophone? And I said, well, maybe pray about it. I was very non-committal. Anyway, he brought his saxophone. He did not know that in my church, 
our music musicians teams are all professionals, professional jazz musicians who had played with Earl Klug, who had played with some of the masters here. And every time um, some of, the, some of the, the great jazz musicians would come to Malaysia, they would play with these guys who happened to be all be in my church. The drummer, the, the keyboardist, the, the lead guitarist, and, and the bassist. So this guy comes in, and he says, can I play with you? And so these musicians are very gracious. And he says, sure, you can play with us. He plays with them, and he realizes he's too petrified to play because his standard, in, for the first time he realizes, is nowhere. It's nowhere. His standards of playing is just, he should be embarrassed to play. But these guys were very gracious. They said, oh, you can play. Play. And he couldn't. He kept his saxophone. Have you been in situations where you thought you're quite good at something? And then you enter into another situation in which the frame is so vastly greater that you're thinking, what am I thinking? In swimming, it's the same thing. I remember once when we went for the, for, for the June invites, you know, those, those swimmers who are from the, you know, the, the, the team that my, 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 my daughters were in, in that setting, it was great. They, were, they had their greats, their legends. Then they went for this June invites, and they suddenly see a vast array of other teams, like 50, 60, 70 other teams, and they are way faster than them. And suddenly, those of us who are new suddenly said, we thought our team was something. But they just got blown out of the water. Have you been in a situation like that? I've also been in that situation where I saw people moving and God had used me, you know, in my campus and all that. And I wanted to be used by God. And there was this very gracious old couple that came and they moved so powerfully in the ways of the Holy Spirit that I said, I want that. Now, I thought that just desiring it was enough. And then they took me into the kind of discipline that involved and the sacrifice that involved and the prayer life that involved. And I realized, what was I thinking? And right there and then, I had to decide what kind of life I want. Do I want the life that I, in the land of the blind, the one-eyed man is king, that I was thought was pretty good, or do I want what God had, which would blow whatever I had out of the water in a nice way? I have sometimes found that even in health, why? Health. I think I'm doing quite well. I'm eating the right thing, exercising in the right way. And then I listen to these YouTube professors and all that, and I realize, oh, the amount of exercise you have to be doing, moderate means, moderate exercise means, you have to be exercising in such a way that you can't even speak to the person next to you. Then I realize that the thought... <laughs> The, the health measures that I was taking for myself are nothing near adequate. I think it's really good for us sometimes to be fit, to be, to be, to be, to be, to be brought up to a standard as much higher than what we are, not so that we can be devastated, but just so that reality can disciple us. Amen? And I want to put it to you that for all the things you desire for in DCF, it will take a long-term decision. If you make a long-term decision, it will affect the short-term things that outcomes that you will have because the way in which a long-term commitment affects the short-term is qualitatively different as well. So let's, let's, let's move on from, from uh, Isaiah chapter, chapter 28. I just want to look at this um, 
in a more deep way. Because the great thing is, there are times in which we suddenly realize that we need a lot more. But what we need cannot come by short-term resolutions that we make. And so what was happening in Isaiah chapter 28 was that Isaiah had been telling the northern kingdom, Assyria is coming, Assyria is coming. And, and he says, you need to build line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, which means you have to get first things first before you go to second things. You can't go to second things not having first things um, established. And so if you want to pray for big things, or you want to ask for big questions to be answered, you have to know, get into the process of letting God begin to build up your hearing, build up your knowledge of Him, build up your, 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 your flexibility, build up your strength to be able to believe things outside of what you see. You have to, or else you can't ask big questions. You can only ask small questions that kids ask. Big, more profound questions require a work that's been done in your life. Someone asked me, am I going to pass my exams? And I said, I don't know. I don't know whether you're going to pass your exams. She wanted, she wanted, she wanted me to give her a word. I said, I don't know. Do you study? Did you pray? Yeah? And, and she said, yeah, I did. And I said, if you do that, at each point of your studying, at each time of your prayer, that work that you do will put you in a different frame for God to answer you different things. You don't start at zero before you studied or before you prayed and you ask God, am I going to pray? That's, that's determinism, right? That's, that's, that's not even Christian, right? That's kind of fortune-telling because God is a God who works with our will. He works with our decisions and all that. That's why decisions are really important because if you study, if you study, God will speak to you at different points of your study. Because God speaks in the present. Amen? So there's a way in which the children of Israel poo-pooed what the, Israel, uh, the, the prophet was saying and didn't listen to him. Didn't listen to him. And said, what are you saying? La, 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 la. You know, have you, have you said that to, ever to your mother? Your mother's nagging you? La, 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 la. You know, mother's nag, right? Fathers also nag. I'm a father who nags too. La, 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 la. And then Isaiah comes back and says, in the same way, you're going to hear the Assyrians coming. And you know how they will sound? La, 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 Just like what you said. And he says, who will God teach knowledge? Those who are just weaned from the breast? Those who are young? No. Because you have to have line upon line, precept upon precept. What he was saying is this, it's too late, actually. It's too late for you to learn from God. It's too late for you to take seriously what the prophet is saying. Now, I believe heartily, and it's my innocent desire, that it is not too late for us. That the days to come will be very hard days. And you will be very hard put to hear the voice of God because there will be so much in your mind that you'll be dry. You'll be so dry because of the fact that you can't handle it. And what God needs to do is to be able to build you up from, from when you're weak, when you are young, when you're fragile. Let Him build you up. But take it seriously. Don't take it in such a way that, ah, this is la, 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 okay, I'll take this. I'll take this. No, take it seriously because He will build you up to such a point that you will know the profound things of God and how to function even under duress. Amen? And so what Isaiah was saying is this. It's your long-term life, not your short-term life. It's your long-term life that, that, has, that will determine. And so he was basically asking, by implication, what have you built up long-term that is powerful? What have you built up long-term that is actually real? Yeah? And that's what Isaiah was saying. Now, I want to put it to you that actually, there are several places in the Bible when you can, where you can actually see this um, um, playing out. 
If you can turn with me to Numbers chapter 14. The children of Israel had been in the wilderness for about, oh, I don't know, a few years, a few months, a few, probably a few months, actually. And Joshua, sorry, and Moses had brought them to the edge of the promised land. And in Numbers chapter 14, he said, I want you to elect one person from each tribe. Make sure you choose people who are filled with the wisdom of God. To go in, have a taste of what the promised land is, and come back and tell you and tell us what it's like. Just tell us what it's like. Then all the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night because of chapter 13, in which the 12 spies came back. Ten of them said, It is indeed a land flowing with milk and honey. We found the grapes. We had to carry them on our shoulders. They are so great. But we can't take them because it's full of giants. We can't do it. But two of them, Joshua and, and, and Caleb, had a different uh, narrative, a different story, a different lens with which they were looking at it. And that became decisive. Okay? So before I go ahead of myself, let me just read this. All the congregation lifted up their voices and cried, and the people wept that night. All the sons of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to them, Would that we had died in the land of Egypt, oh, or would that we had died in this wilderness. Why is the Lord bringing us into this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and our little ones will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to return to Egypt? So they said to one another, Let us appoint a leader and return to Egypt. Then Moses and Aaron fell on their faces in the presence of all the assembly of the congregation of the sons of Israel, Joshua the son of Nun, and Caleb the son of Jephunneh, of those who had spied out the land, tore their clothes, and they spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, The land which we pass through to spy out is an exceeding good land. If the Lord is pleased with us, then he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land which flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord, and do not fear the people of the land, for they will be our prey. Their protection has been removed from them, and the Lord is with us. And the Lord is with us. Do not fear them. But all the congregation said to stone them with stones. Then the glory of the Lord appeared in the tent of meeting to all the sons of Israel. And the Lord said to Moses, "Blow, sorry, how long will these people spurn me? And how long will they not believe in me, despite all the signs which I have performed in their, their midst? I will smite them with pestilence and dispossess them." And make you into a nation greater and mightier than them. And Moses said to the Lord, and he convinced the Lord not to do that, and we won't have time to read that. Verse 21, so the Lord said, I have pardoned them according to your word, but indeed as I live, all the earth will be filled with the glory of the Lord. Surely all the men who have seen my glory and my signs which I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness, yet have put me to the test these ten times and have not listened to my voice, shall by no means see the land which I swore to their fathers, nor shall any of these who spurn me see it. Verse 24, but my servant Caleb, because he has a different, had a different spirit and has followed me fully, I will bring him to the land which he entered and his descendants shall take possession of it. Later on, his, later on he says, surely you shall not come into the land in which I swore to settle you, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. Your children, however, whom you said would become a prey, I will bring them in, and they will know the land which you have rejected. But as for you, your corpse, corpses will fall in the wilderness. So I think what's happening here is that um, the children of Israel came to a place where, in truth to them, the reality was God had brought them to a brick wall, and all the promises that God had given to them were actually fake promises. Because the giants were there. I guess they thought that because God had given them the promised land, there won't be giants. 
there won't be much opposition. But then when they saw the giant, they thought, how can we? It's impossible for us to enter into the land. So therefore, God has tricked us. He's fraudulently given a promise to us. Joshua and Caleb saw it differently. They saw that God had promised them, but they just needed to overcome the, the giants. You know, I have shared before this congregation about riding a bike. Do you remember that? You know, 1 Corinthians it says, God has given you all things that pertain to knowledge and all, and all that and wisdom. I said, if you want to ride a bike, it would not be sufficient for you to know all the formulas, the physics formulas, to know how a bike is ridden, how that actually works, how the torque should be handled and how you should balance and exactly what position on the bike you should be. You just have to ride it. And if you ride it, if you've never ridden a bike, you ride it for 300 yards. At the end of 300 yards, even if you fall over, you will know how to ride a bike. It will come to you somewhere in this 300 yards. I shared that with you before. So I shared that with the, the church that I was ministering to in Malaysia. I said, you know, riding a bike is something that it comes to you. It comes, it's a tacit knowledge, not a cognitive knowledge, but it's a tacit knowledge. Michael Pol Polanyi uh, uh, talks about tacit knowledge even in riding a bike. So I said, the thing is this, we have to keep riding because if you really keep riding, the knowledge which does not come to you immediately will form itself on the way to the 300 yards. So I said, that's, so, so everybody thought, oh, that's great. And I thought, that's what a great analogy that was. Then someone else, we had a Q&A and someone on the, on the panel used that analogy and says, you know, the problem with some of us is when the bike, when we fall off the bike, we don't want to get back up again. And so all we have is the knowledge that we have a bike, but we walk the bike to the, to the, to the end of the 300 yards. And I thought, whoa, I never thought of that. I say, that's fantastic. And then the Lord spoke to me that, and I, and I felt it so clear. Not only that, <laughs> I didn't say anything. I, not only that, your experience and definition of the 300 yards will be vastly different from someone who picked himself up or herself up and rode the bike. Because your experience will be this. The only way to handle a bike is to walk it. In fact, the bike is a burden. You can actually walk faster the 300 yards if you didn't have the bike. And if someone told you the bike will help you to turbocharge your, the speed of your, 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 your perambulation by a lot, you would say, that's not true, that's not my experience. Your lived experience and your decision will determine what 300 yards looks like. It will determine what the bike is about as well. It will also determine how you're going to live your life. If you've decided, I'm never going to fall off a bike, you will not fall off a bike by going this way. You know that you have a bike, but as far as the meaning of the bike and the use of the bike is concerned, you will have a completely different expectation. And that was what was happening with the children of Israel. The children of Israel had, had come to a point that after a number of months and years in the wilderness, they had come to the conclusion that the promised land cannot be taken. Could not be taken. Except for Joshua and Caleb. Through the 40 years that they wandered around the music, they kept bright the fact that the promised land could be taken. Both had equal conviction, and both had completely different um, conclusions. I would put it to you that the bike was not a failure, 
neither was God nor prophecy, but it was a failure of faith on the part of the, of the, of the children of Israel. Somehow, falling off the bike was not the failure of the bike. The failure of faith had to do with the fact that if faith comes by hearing, that somehow when they fell off the bike, no voice or word came from the other side because faith comes by hearing, hearing from the word. And that's why I say it was a failure of faith in the sense that they didn't hear. For some reason, they couldn't hear God saying, it can be done. Somehow, they didn't hear or feel the evidence of things unseen. They didn't feel the evidence of things unseen. They didn't feel the substance of things hoped for. Somehow, the wilderness experience didn't pull that up for them. Somehow, they just, it just didn't come up. It was not a failure of the bike, but it was a failure of their faith, their, their hearing. And so sometimes what happens is that our hearing is commensurate with how we follow him. And that's why um, later on, when Caleb, 40 years later, and comes to Joshua and says, he repeats to him three times, I fully followed the Lord. I fully followed the Lord. And when I fully followed the Lord, the implication would be, I heard the evidence of things unseen. I felt the substance of things hoped for. I felt it. It came upon me. It was not just faith in terms of the mind. It was what, what, the, what Paul calls the apodixis, the, the impact of something of the Word of God to such an extent that its impact upon us is something that cannot be denied. It's almost as objective, almost physical, but on a whole different level. And so I want to put it to you that is that Sometimes crucial decisions are made unconsciously when you fell off the bike. Sometimes we make these decisions when we fall off the bike. I remember one such decision I made when I fell off the bike. It happened when, many years ago, we used, when the church began, we used to invite people to our house and we'd have our meetings and, and we'd feed everybody who came every week, every week. And then there came a time in which we continued doing that when we moved to the new house. That time we, we did that, was we were living in apartments. And I remember I had an experience in which I felt Let's bring this group of people to our house and just give them food. It didn't happen that we had a really good time. But after that, almost every single one of them harmed us in a certain way. I won't, I won't mention, I, and I don't want to over-dramatize it. And I didn't realize that after that, I had decided unconsciously that that bike doesn't work. For, that, for, for me, I would not use that bike anymore because I didn't realize how much I was affected by that. The very people that we had opened our heart to. Now, it's going to happen to you, and it must happen to you, or else our love is not genuine. we we'll test our love, right? So I continue like that, my love is not genuine, it's just human. Expecting, you know, re repayment or all that. No. There are some of us who have made a long-term decision and you don't even realize that you've made that long-term decision because you've been hurt. You fell off the bike. And as far as your conclusion about the bike, this bike, the only safe way is to hold it this way and, and walk it along. Because if you get on it, you will fall. And because of that, long term, you look back, you don't, have to, you don't have to discern too much, you don't have to pray about it, you just look long term in your life. Where have you come? What miracles has God done in your life? How many people have been 
impacted by your life? How many have been, have been saved? How many demons cast out? How many healings taking place? How, many, how much of the impact of God has come into your life? I'm not using this as a way of, of crassly uh, defining spiritual life. I'm just saying, over the, over, over, over the, over the long term, we can, we can ask the question, has something happened to you? Something happened to me. And suddenly I realized that I had made some decisions. Some decisions that would close my heart because of all that had happened. And I, of course, repented before God. For some, it may be this. You've tried to step out in faith and you fell on your faith. And you've decided for that, bike riding is for only certain kinds of people those people who are gifted for bike riding. Only cyclists can do that. Not for me. I'm, about the, I'm a more pedestrian kind of person. I'll have my bike. I just feel that the bike is a bit of a burden. I'll just walk it. And that's what life is. You will never fall off a bike if you walk it. So I believe that God has something for us. I wonder, as we close in prayer, would you bow your heads with me? There are great and mighty promises, the Bible says, awaiting us. Great and mighty promises await us. If you've come to VCF for any length of time, you know that the promise that God gives to us is that we will know our God, display strength, and do exploits. I believe that is true. But perhaps a decision has been made somewhere because you, like me, fell off the bike. And as a result of that, you've decided the only way to live the Christian life is to walk your bike, not ride it. I would like to renew that promise of God to you, that God is a God who fulfills His promise. But you will have to get out of your frame and say, Lord, I can't just fit you into my schedule or fit you into my own purposes. I'm going to have to tear up my frame so that I can come to a whole different existence with you. And if you're willing to, God will actually prepare you even as He's preparing us for Fall Conference. And believing that Fall Conference is going to be one in which it will be built on these long-term decisions that we make. For some, God is saying, I want you to give your life to me, your future, because I'm leading you. And as I'm leading you, I want you to commit yourself to daily check in with me. Daily check in with me. You've longed for a great prayer life. You've longed to be able to hear the voice of God. It's there for you. You've only gone 20 feet. There's 300 feet ahead. And at each, if you decide long term, the next 10 feet will make all the difference. Because if you make a long term decision to stay on your bike, the next 10 feet even will make a difference. And so, I wonder whether that is something. For some of you, you've decided to pray for your friends and you started with so much zeal that you're believing that God is going to bring your whole workplace or your whole family to the Lord and all that, and it hasn't happened. And because of that, you pull back because you've already anticipated that your friends are going to reject Christ. And I want to put it to you that, that God says, get back on your bike because you don't know when I'm going to move. And if you, if you get back on your bike, somewhere along the line, you will begin to see fruit. Don't give up. Lord, we welcome your presence. We welcome your presence today. To all those who feel that they've fallen off their bike, whose, whose view of the next 300 meters or yards is decidedly depressing, And we can't shake ourselves out of it. So we ask you right now that you 
pour out your mercy upon us. Isaiah chapter 52 says, Awake, awake, put on your strength. Shake off the dust from your feet. Take off the manacles or the chains. Or, for they will, from now on, come into you no, no more. The, uns- the unclean or the uncircumcised. What he's saying is this. There is a possibility for you to look at the next 300 yards and see God clearing that 300 yards, straightening it in front of you. But you have to make a decision. Despite the giants. I find that God is doing that with me all the time. Correcting decisions I've made because I fell off the bike a few times and made decisions not knowing that I'd done so. Ways in which I pull back from God or from things that He's challenging me to. But may we as a church present ourselves before God and we say, God, we are up for all the miracles you want to do in our lives, all the salvation, all the healing, all the justice that we want to see happen. That can only happen by supernatural means. We give you all our natural selves for that purpose. If God's been speaking to you with all eyes closed, all heads bowed, I just want to invite you just to lift your hands up right now and say, yes, Lord, I want to commit myself to you. Go ahead. Just lift up your hands. You don't have to be all, all uh, uh, vocal, uh, visible. But you know yourself. Just lift up your hands before the Lord and say, yes, Lord, I want to. I want it. Amen. I want it. I want it. Even if it means doing a quiet time regularly, in which what's going to decide whether I do my quiet time in the morning or whatever it is, is not going to be some extraneous thing or some distraction, but you. I'll make you the compelling reason why I'm decided. Lord, we welcome you. We welcome your presence. We welcome your presence. There are some who are making decisions because your, your children's life depends upon your, on your life. Your children will see an opened up frame in which God is doing great and mighty things in and through your life. And you're making a decision that will affect generations after them, after you. We welcome you, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. Bless your name. Put your hand upon this church right now. Do not let us go. We welcome you. Before even soaking time happens, this moment can be looked back at 200, uh, two years later and be seen as a turning point, a watershed in our lives. I have decided to follow Jesus. Joshua chapter 14. I alone and Joshua followed the Lord fully. We thank you, Lord, for being with us. In Jesus' name, amen.